There is no greater madman in all of Tamriel, a Daedric prince of madness, a man of whimsy, doing anything so long as it pleases him and brings a grin to his face. From transmogrification to mind control and hallucinations, he casts a plethora of inhumane spells on mortals to satiate his need to be humored. He is an unfair god, an unstable mix of cleverness and insanity, unpredictable to the point of confusion. This is all true, however it leaves a greater question yet to be answered. Who exactly is Sheogorath? Of all the gods of Nern, many can be understood by mortals, at least to some degree. Take Hercene, for example, the Daedric Prince of the Hunt and creator of the Lycanthropes, a god to be feared, yet is understood enough by humans of the realms so that they are able to avoid his ire and not provoke his wrath. While obscure to most mortals, Meridia, Prince of the Energy of All Living Things, is another example of a well-understood and somewhat predictable god. She is an enemy to all undead and all who disrespect life. As such, one could avoid her gaze by valuing life and striking down undead as they find them. This sort of consideration towards the ideals of the gods is not as sound when it comes to dealing with Sheogorath, however. He is a being of whimsy. No amount of forward thinking or research could make him predictable, even to the simplest degree. His pure, unadulterated madness being a far greater threat than a solely evil being. This due to madness and insanity being things you can never prepare for. Sheogorath coaxes out the weaknesses of mortals feeds off of that weakness and agitates it only to make it even greater. He then uses this to sway them towards his ideal of madness, to guide them into his realm of the Shivering Isles. Once inside, he is able to play out his whimsical games of magic and madness against them, torturing their minds and stretching their sanity to its absolute limits in the process. Wry without equal, Shiogarath holds in his realm giggling loons, flamboyant otters, and craven mutilators. The Mad Prince will ply profitless bargains and promote senseless bloodshed for nothing more than the joy of another's confusion, tragedy, or rage. He punished one individual by transforming them into a wheel of cheese, his crime having grown a beard. Another was made to jump from an impossible height only to splatter against the ground of punishment point. For the gross offense of wearing too much cologne. Sheogorath is one of the only Daedric princes whose creation may be linked in some way to the destruction of an Aedra. This is one of the only two groups of immortals who took part in creating Mundus, as well as being the progenitors of Myrrh and Men. The only other Daedric princes said to have been created this way are Malakath and Meridia. The Aldmiri believe him to have been created instead by the removal of Lorcan's divine spark. In one such myth, they describe him simply as a sithis shaped hole of the world, however this is likely not true. This due to being in the Shivering Isles, Sheogorath's Chamberlain Haskell states that this interpretation is likely not the case. Sheogorath believes that his madness is most often a blessing to those who become afflicted with it. He states, Do not believe madness to be a curse, mortal. For some it is the greatest of blessings, a bitter mercy perhaps, but mercy nonetheless. Sheogorath has a realm within oblivion, much like the other Daedric princes, however he doesn't treat his the same way they might theirs, changing the landscape, wildlife, and even the weather to suit his fanciful whims anytime he pleases. As explained by Haskell, his chamberlain, the Shivering Isles morph and disguise into anything that his lord Sheogorath wishes them to be. Passing through the inhuman portal to his realm, one will be immediately affronted by an exotic and twisting landscape, adorned with countless forms of striking wildlife and creatures never seen seen anywhere on Nern. Some examples being the Baliwag, a predatory amphibious creature that makes its home in lakes and other large bodies of water, preying on those unlucky enough to get too close. The Grumites, appearing somewhat like a large bipedal form of the Baliwag and using tools and weapons to inflict death against other creatures of the Isles. And the Skallen, one of the most feared creatures in Sheogoth's realm. They are deadly hunters, even able to cast invisibility on themselves to get the jump on their unsuspecting prey. You will also be greeted by a rather foreboding quote from the madman in charge as you arrive. A new arrival! A shame about my gatekeeper. I'm so happy I could just tear out your intestines and strangle you with them! <laughs> he opened the way for mortals to enter this realm at the end of the third era by sending an invitation to all of Tamriel by way of the strange mangled portal in Nibbin Bay. He demanded a mortal champion be sent into his domain so that he may test their metal against his foe. This realm within oblivion is often referred to by others as the Madhouse or the Asylum. This already hints to the nature 
nature of this nightmare landscape, it is split between two areas, the first being Mania, the fantastical bright side where art enthusiasts and madness-driven revelers take residence, the latter being Dementia, the horrific dark side where those gifted with the more notorious of Sheogorath blessings reside. The flora and fauna of Mania reflect the lighter side of Sheogorath's madness, being quite colorful and having many large mushrooms across its landscape, the fauna matching this very same aesthetic. Meanwhile, Dementia reflects very well the darker side to the lunacy, spotted with swamps, bogs, and dark woods with wildlife to match, some of which were spoken about earlier. All wildlife from both sides of the aisles are connected underneath the surface to a single large root system that is in fact a living organism. This links well to the quote from Ravite that goes as follows, Sheogorath is already inside each of us. You have already lost. Mania is adorned with many colorful plants and creatures, spotted by the kaleidoscopic mushrooms in countless colors. The capital of this side of the isles is New Shioth, home to the greatest cultures and culinary tastes in the entire realm. This is accentuated by the vast amounts of greenery and landscaping. Ruled over by Thaddin, Duke of Mania, a man recognized to be the master of merriment thanks to his cheerful and overall eccentric demeanor. A location of note within Mania is the Fetid Grove, located southwest west of Camp Hopeful near the center of the lake. This arboreal cave system is eye-catching in its very unique atmosphere, having this feel as if we are in a forest so dense that the trees themselves create walls and a roof overhead. Dementia, meanwhile, is dull, colorless, and cold, lacking any of the joy or whimsy present within mania. The ones who keep the order on this side are the dark seducers, similar to the golden saints present within mania. One landmark you may be unlucky enough to stumble across on your trek through this destitute land is the Hill of Suicides, a place where you'll likely encounter the lingering restless spirits of those who took their own lives, who are trapped in a state between life and death, cursed to forever think of the pain and suffering that once drove them to commit the act which doomed them to this final fate. Within the Shivering Isles, there exists two separate religious societies, being the worshippers of Sheogorath and the Apostle Cult. The worshippers are just as you would imagine. They are those who idolize and place Sheogorath on a pedestal. Most homes within the Isles have within them a small bust of the Mad Prince, usually placed alongside lettuce and string, these being the two most favorite playthings of the God of Madness. Within the worshippers, there are also the Zealots, who believe that Sheogorath is a living god, and that Arden's soul is his mortal half, and the heretics, who believe that he is just an extremely powerful mortal man, playing the part of a Daedric Prince. The Apostle Cult differs, and that they believe that the Prince of Madness is unfit to rule over the Shivering Isles after it was discovered by their leader, Kirita, that Sheograth had left the Isles, abandoning his responsibilities as its ruler. While these apostles believed that he had left, there was a very different occurrence happening that most were unaware of. Sheograth was not always the man-god. There was once a Daedric prince named Jigalag. His ideology was that of order. He represents logic, order, and deduction, through which he has been able to peer into the future and see every detail of both Mundus and Oblivion, as well as any anything that will ever happen. This knowledge gave him an immeasurable sense of certainty in his ideals and actions, leading him to believe that the concept of individuality is just an illusion. This was not his only strength, as he was also one of the most powerful of the Daedric Princes, being feared by many of the other gods. They believed that through his omnipotence he became aware of his own nature, and that through knowing that forbidden knowledge he became mad. They then all came together to curse him to live in antagonism with everything he believed in, forced to live as a madman man and bring chaos to the world of order he had lusted after. Henceforth, Jigalag came to be known by a new name, the Daedric Prince of Madness, Sheogorath. Jigalag speaks about the Shivering Isles and their present state, saying that it was not always so. Once I ruled this realm, a world of perfect order, my dominion expanded across the seas of oblivion with each passing era. This is only a semi-permanent change, however. He is able to return to his original form once every era, at the end of each era that is. This is known within the Isles as Grey March. During this time, the personality of Jigalag comes to the surface and exerts complete control over his realm to summon his Knights of Order, thoughtless humanoid crystal soldiers who know nothing but following their master's orders to burn the Isles to the ground and slaughter its people. As spoken by Gracundo Udico, the Knights are relentless. We are the only thing standing between them and the total destruction of the Fringe. When the Grey March comes to an end, Sheogorath leaves 
and Jigalath materializes in person to finish off the Isles. In reality, he is simply turning into Jigalag himself. Following the destruction, he then returns to once again recreate the Isles and its inhabitants, causing both dueling entities to suffer greatly. There are still some amongst the mortals of Nern that would worship Sheogarath, even after knowing of his actions and inhuman personality. He was originally a Daedric Prince of the Chimer, now known as the Dunmer. They revered him in their ancient ancestral worship. This changed when the dominant religion changed to the Tribunal Temple within Morrowind. When this occurred, Sheogarath, Merun's Dagon, Malakath, and Molagbao became known as the Four Corners of the House of Troubles. This was also known as the Bad Daedra. The one who ordained this group was the Dunmer prophet Vela. Sheogarath then rebelled against the Tribunal, leading to the reverence and worship of him becoming a crime punishable by death. When he rebelled, Sheogarath tricked the Moon Bar Dao, inciting it to throw itself into the city of Vivek, one of three cities made to honor the Tribunal. He justified this action by claiming the city was built in mockery of the gods. As Bar Dao approached the city, it is said that Vivek froze the Great Moon in its descent and thwarted its plan of impact, forcing it to forever swear itself into the service of the Tribunal. Within the culture of these Dunmer, Sheogarath's role is to test for any psychological shortcomings and is associated with the fear shown toward them by the other races. Within the Empire, Sheogarath's status as one of the Daedra Princes has made his worship largely considered taboo. However, all throughout Tamriel, there are statues in reverence of the Mad God, hidden within secrecy. According to Gwynis, a Bosmer who has claimed to have convened with both Sheogarath and Hormaeus Mora, there are festivities and invocations held at the shrines of Sheogarath in celebration of Mad Pelagius Day on the second of Sun's Dawn. Sheogarath also had a place in the beliefs of the Khajiit. He is one of the more prominent Daedric princes within their culture. In the Khajiit myth of creation, Sheogarath is often referred to as Shegara, or even the Skuma Cat within elsewhere. Within their beliefs, Sheogarath is believed to have been the offspring of Anur and Fatomai. Shegarath, the mind god, his sphere in the mortal mind and its stability. He tests Khajiit on the path by making them doubt the truth of their own thoughts, beliefs, and actions. He must be faced along the path and overcome before a Khajiit can visit Hermora's library. Some tribes believe Shegarath is dead and has been replaced by something other. In the early days of man, before the realms had developed into what they are now, Sheogarath decided on one of his whims to walk amongst the mortals. He donned the guise of a rather smooth gentleman with a cane and began venturing from town to town without being recognized. After a full 11 days, he had decided that the lives of mortals were far more boring than even his otherworldly existence. While sitting and pondering how he could possibly make their lives more interesting, a charming young woman nearby commented to herself that the sounds of the birds were very beautiful beautiful. Sheogarath silently agreed with her. Mortals with their wretched and mundane voices could never hope to replicate the beautiful sounds of nature. This nature he was unable to change, for that was the purview of the Daedric Princes. However, he could fashion them tools that could attempt to replicate those stunning sounds. To do this would be simple, he thought. To make charming tools, one would need charming materials. He then shifted his eyes back to the woman who commented about the bird's beautiful singing, and what followed was just another whim of Sheogarath, one he he considered a gift. Shogarath took hold of the petulant woman and ripped her asunder. From her tendons he made lutes. From her skull and arm bones he made a drum. From her bones he made flutes. He presented these gifts to the mortals and thus music was born. However deranged he may be, he is all the while just as clever. He once ventured to the frigid peaks of the mountaintops in Skyrim and called forth to Hercene to have a discussion. Once Hercene materialized, the Prince of Madness offered a contest. Each of them was to groom a beast to meet back at this place again in precisely three years' time. They would then have a fight to the death. Hercene agreed to these terms and they each went to their respective realms. Hercene was confident, however still knew Sheogarath to be a trickster, so in secret he bred for this bout an abomination made up of an ancient Daedroth afflicted with lycanthropy. Now, the greatest peerless horror even amongst Hercene's finest warriors. The fated day of the duel soon arrived, and as Sheogarath whistled, leaning over a stone patiently, the Prince of the Hunt struck his spear into the earth beneath him, summoning forth the monstrosity he had created. Sheogarath was not phased by this strangely enough. He then tipped his hat and stepped aside, revealing his challenger. But a small, colorful bird, chirping, barely audible, stood before the behemoth of Hercene. 
cursing. The Daedroth leaped atop the stone the bird was pitched on, having believed he had crushed it instantly. Just then, a faint song drifted through the air, as the bird hopped atop the snout of the beast, pecking between its scales. The creature then blinded itself in an attempt to hit the bird, continuing to attack itself in a useless struggle to remove and kill the bird. Hercene watched on in shame as his greatest creation destroyed itself until the beast fell and the victor had been decided. Hercene then cursed in the forgotten tongues before exiting to his realm, Cheograth then turning and calling for his small pet to return to him victorious. They then strolled down the mountain while whistling in unison. This is the event described in the book 16 Accords of Madness, Volume 6. Cheograth was not only clever enough to correctly foretell what variant of fighter Hercene would bring, but used that knowledge to find an adversary fitting for it, one that would be a perfect counter to the beast he knew nothing about but assumptions. Having his wits about him, yet still using this battle as an opportunity to show that there are sometimes methods to his madness, winning in a way to utterly shame a fellow Daedric Prince. When it comes to the 16 Accords of Madness, there are only actually three available to read within the series, with the others never being found or mentioned otherwise. There exists a quite fitting theory that there are only three volumes in existence, and that Sheograth himself made it this way, calling them the 16 Accords to drive Hermaeus Mora mad in his fruitless hunt for the other 13 volumes, knowing that he seeks any and all knowledge and will seek out the rest in an attempt to complete the collection. This, however, has not been confirmed and is strictly speculation. There was once a time when Sheograth scorned his fellow Daedric Prince Malakath so greatly that it left a mark on him for all eternity. There was an orc warrior named Emeg Gro Kaya, born into this world to a young maiden who perished during childbirth, never having met his father either. Raised by the shaman of his tribe, setting off from his village shortly after performing the ceremony of crafting one's own heavy scaled armor when they reached 15 years of age. Tales of his heroics and exploits always made their way back to his village, becoming known as the Noble Orc Crusader. Less than two years after reaching maturity, Emeg was camping when all of a sudden he heard a thin voice calling to him amidst the mist of the thickening night. Surprised to hear his native tongue spoken by a voice very obvious not of his kin. Peering into the murk, Emeg was able to make out the silhouette of a cloaked figure. From voice alone, he thought them an old hag. This stranger then offered him a gift, pulling from his cloak a bundle wrapped in cloth which he then threw between himself and the orc. Emeg cautiously removed the cloth to reveal a wide, curved blade with an ornately decorated handle. It wasn't much to look at in its present state. However, if it were to be cleaned and sharpened while replacing the missing jewels, it would become a weapon worthy even of a one more greater than himself. Her name is Neb Cresson, spoke the stranger, seeking the appreciation adorning Emeg's face. Emeg, knowing nothing is free, asked what the stranger needed in exchange. They spoke and agreed on a stack of furs, warm food, and a handful of coin. A week following this encounter, the stranger had disappeared, but without a trace, and Emeg had yet to need to unsheath the fine blade. Emeg's nostrils flared, but he was unable to see or smell his unknown guest. Emeg's guard was up, slowly and silently unsheathed sheathing Neb Crescent, yet he is not entirely certain of the events that transpired next. His next conscious memory was the image of his curved blades sweeping through the air in front of him, splattering blood across the pale white snow of the forest floor, followed by an uncontrollable frenzy of bloodlust. It was then that he finally saw the victim laid before him, the body of an orc woman a few years younger than himself, her body a canvas of grisly wounds carved beyond recognition. Emeg then threw the blade away from himself as he recovered from the madness that overtook him and fled the gruesome scene in shame and disgust. It was this macabre scene where Sheogarath summoned Malakath. They then held court. Malakath questions why he was shown the scene of one of his people before him massacred after quelling his initial outrage. By birth, she was yours, brother outcast, but she was a daughter of mine by her own habits. My mourning here is no less than your own, my outrage no less great, spoke Sheogarath to his brother Malakath. After they then agreed that the one who committed this act must be put down as punishment, Sheograth asked Malakath to be the one to do it, and to do so with his blade, also to permit him to take the soul of the perpetrator afterward so that he may punish them for their crimes within the Shivering Isles for all eternity. Agreeing in his outrage, Malakath then took his leave to correct this atrocity using the hefty, curved blade that the Mad God had chosen. Materializing in front of the assailant, he drew his blade, then swung it in a smooth arc, lopping off the head of his foe and plunging the hilt into his chest, choking 
choking off the spurts of blood into a steady, growing stain of red, bubbling from beneath the scaled armor and heavy cloak. Malakath's eyes went wide as he looked upon the severed head. To his horror, he only now recognized that the man he killed was not only one of his awesomer children, but very literally a son he had blessed a young orc maiden with years hence. For longer than imaginable, it felt as if the world stood still while they locked eyes. Then, silent as oiled steel, Cheograt strode into the clearing. He hefted Emeg's now dismembered body into a gray sack and hurled it over his shoulder, reclaiming Neb Cresson as he turned to walk away. Malakath began to stand, but kneeled again, knowing he had been fooled by the Mad Prince into irreversibly damning his own offspring to the realm of Cheograt, and mourned his failure as the sounds of his son's hoarse plea faded into the frozen horizon. These retellings only scratched the surface of Sheograth's madness, cunning, and willingness to go to any lengths to cause misery and pain to others only for his own joy and amusement. Neb Crescent was only one of the many weapons and artifacts used by the King of the Asylums. Sheograth has created many artifacts recognized even within the mortal realm. There are seven total if you were to include the previously mentioned Neb Crescent. The most recognizable amongst these is the Wabajack, a mysterious staff that casts from a pool of spells at random each time it is used. The effects of these spells vary from buffing the target, disintegrating them to ash instantly, or transforming them into an object or creature at random. The sheerly unpredictable nature of this weapon truly embodies the chaos of its creator. The head of the staff strongly resembles the portal to the Shivering Isles present in Nibbin Bay. Another of his artifacts is the Gamble Putty Glove. Yes, I know it is a strange name, but all Sheograt's creations have that touch of madness. This glove casts an enchantment on the wearer when used, greatly raising half their primary attributes while lowering the other half. These are used in Morrowind to renew a very important pact that prevents Sheograth from afflicting all Dunmer with madness. The strangest of his artifacts must be the Fork of Horribilation, or Forky as Sheograth is known to call it, known to be used by Sheograth as a way of forcing its wielders to commit heinous crimes, horrification by the way being the technical term used to describe goosebumps. This is quite literally a two-pronged fork, just as the name would lead you to leave. However, the enchantment on the fork does nothing except hinder the wielder's magicka. The next artifact within his lineup is the Staff of the Everscamp, a somewhat unique weapon that is able to conjure four Everscamps from Oblivion who are able to neither be banished nor killed. These scamps will follow the wielder and fight for them. Fifth in the lineup of Sheograth's artifacts is the Spear of Bitter Mercy, a weapon able to summon a powerful Storm Atronach wherever the wielder points its tip. This can be obtained by the Nereverine within Morrowind by completing an absurd task given by the Prince of Madness himself. He tells them to use the aforementioned Fork of Horripilation to defeat a giant bull niche. If they are to complete this, however, they will be able to return the Fork in exchange for the Spear of Bitter Mercy. The final artifact associated with Sheograth's symbols of rulership is his Staff of Sheograth. This weapon wielded by the Mad Prince himself is able to freeze all foes in place instantly. The only way for us to acquire this weapon is by becoming the new Mad God ourselves and assuming the name of Sheograth. The final and somewhat lesser known of his artifacts is the Folium Discognitum, a thick grimoire written in what can only be described as the indecipherable ramblings of a craven madman, however capable of granting its reader vast power and knowledge. This description also describes very well its creator, Sheograth. The Daedric Prince of Madness is utterly unpredictable with actions that are often unjustifiable. However, his charms lie within his whimsy and character, all the while being extremely clever and powerful, allowing him to fulfill his hellish whims. He is truly not one to be trifled with, nor one to be reasoned with. If you ever encounter him yourself, I hope you too do not fall victim to his hellishly deranged schemes. This has been Sheograth, the Mad God. Once Jigalag, the Daedric Prince of Order, turned mad by the curse placed unto him by his fellow princes for possessing a great power which they all feared, doomed to repeat the cycles of order and madness for all eternity. If you did enjoy, please leave a like and subscribe to support the channel. It means a lot, and I'm trying to hit 100 subscribers by the end of April. If you're interested in Skyrim or Fallout as well, I urge you to check out one of the videos on screen now. Once again, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.